Why should we care about global affairs? Welcome to the General Podcast. This is a podcast series where we discuss events and issues so that students and everyone else can learn from them at the same time. I'm your host, JH. And I'm your co-host, Eunice. And today, once again, we have our very special guest, Rehan, on the show back with us. Thank you for doing two podcasts with us, Rehan. So, hi everyone. I'm Rehan. This time, your most eligible bachelor. <laughs> Open for all applications. Uh, applications will be uh, reviewed on a case by case basis. For any information about my introduction, please refer to the previous podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All okay. right. Thank you so much for joining us again, Rayan, with that. Right. And speaking of the previous episode, one thing that we were also previously discussing was a, a lot about war and conflicts that are happening throughout the world. Right. So, of course, the main subject in question that we focus a lot on was about the Russian-Ukraine conflict that was happening. In a country such as Singapore where we're living in, we are so far flung from such issues and from the conflict itself to the point where the effects are almost negligible to us within our own country, right? So why then do we need to care about such issues in the first place? Should we then still be invested in international affairs as well? What do you guys think? Mm, I think we can definitely see it from the standpoint that uh, why there are people who believe that there is no need to pay attention to these uh, foreign affairs or international politics. The reason being because, uh, like what you have mentioned, JH, is that it's really too far away. Like, for example, whatever happened in the Ukraine-Russian war, right, it's so far away from us that it doesn't seem very important to really pay attention to the necessary details. And whatever is happening to the conflict, the only connection that we Singaporeans can have with this conflict would be that they are also people. We are also people. And Ukraine is considered as the um, weaker country, right, compared with the other countries around. And drawing back to Singapore, definitely we are geographically, we are really quite um, small, tiny red dot, and therefore seem to be like the weaker country of sorts. So I would say that these are the connections that we can probably establish with what's going on in that particular war or that particular conflict. So it is fair to say that there are people who, who are going to think that this is really not very important because the connection is so weak. And another thing to also think about as well is that to us, whatever implications that happen in that conflict, right, it doesn't directly affect us and another thing is also there are people who uh, feel that currently in this climate that we have right there are too many uh, negative news that's ongoing so out of sight out of mind so what about you Rehan? what do you think for me i i, I believe that i'll be the opposition today <laughs> so uh, obviously me being me uh, obviously narcissi narcissistically a man ahead of his time i believe that it's important to learn about international politics because Fun fact, do you know how many countries is in between Norway and North Korea? No, we, it's not fun for us because we don't us. know. <laughs> <laughs> one. It's just one because it's being only being like bordered by Russia. Both are being bordered by Russia. So you'll actually be pleasantly surprised like how close certain countries are with each other. And these days, we actually do have a lot of international aviation going on. So it's not uncommon for uh, obviously a more affluent individual. Probably like maybe like having breakfast in London, going to Hong Kong for lunch, and then winding up in San Francisco. Ah, oh, how romantic, right? I wish for I for the rich human. I wish I could live that lifestyle, but but jokes aside, but yeah, international aviation actually has made our world much smaller, mm. much more interconnected. And the thing about uh, learning about different societies is also that it also trains uh, like your reasoning skills and ability to think from like both sides of the coin or even multifaceted. That's why you have people like. Yours truly. Anyway, j again, jokes aside, I do have friends who are in the absolutely liberal Yale and US. Uh, or these days, uh, NUS calls it West Wing, which I absolutely don't like the name, but that's for another day. <laughs> so, for another day. Okay. so, in Yale and US, there are actually a lot of international students from all sorts of countries. One of my best friends actually got to deal with a uh, Uzbek guy, and, after, and obviously, he instantly thought about me. Because I'm such an expert at everything, right? Yeah, I'm just kidding. I'm, <laughs> sure. I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I mean, um, it's more that like, but definitely Uzbek culture is definitely one of my strengths. Because since I have already mentioned in the previous podcast that uh, I do like Uyghur culture, I do consider myself as a subject matter expert on it. And Uzbe Uzbek culture is actually very closely related. So he obviously he thought of me, and then but he also realized that he couldn't really talk much with the Uzbek guy because he doesn't know that much about Uzbekistan. So. That's why one of my, my reflections is that you, you don't wait until you see something and you decide, oh my god, why didn't I learn this earlier? Mm. Why not you learn it first and then afterwards when you meet something, you use it. And because I'm a business student and I also definitely realize that 
in this very globalized world, you definitely need to deal with a lot of uh, foreign companies, a lot of foreigners. And business climate is honestly, in my opinion, not that far away from societal climate. So it's obviously better to learn more about their culture and then endear to them. And you get their business, you win, they win, they're happy. You're happy. All right. So, yeah. So of course, one thing that we can also definitely take note of, which was kind of like um, economic impacts. I think we were looking at that. We were exploring how being aware of what other countries are up to are also opportunities for you to uh, make money as well. When you know how other people do business, um, of course, then it also makes us more invested in global markets. So recently, because of the conflict as well, my my stocks have taken a dip. Mm. <laughs> so monetary-wise, I guess from this standpoint, uh, we are at a, at a bit of a loss here because of the current situation. But at the same time, it also definitely presents us opportunities to kind of like make money in this regard as well. There were quite a number of points that uh, Rehan was sharing early on. And in particular, he was mentioning about this idea of it had actually made him much more attuned to and being aware of other cultures as well, which I did think was very, very important. Because uh, for me personally, I take reference from this uh, content creator called Nas Daily, where he once made a remark against someone who commented on his one minute video about Singapore, that, you know, it's not all uh, sunshine and rainbows in Singapore. And basically, he then mentioned this one line that really stuck out to me about how Singaporeans had lacked perspective. And that was in his words. Okay, so for me, I do feel that being in the loop of things that are happening within other nations, it does actually then tell us a lot about how we are in Singapore, about how privileged we actually are. So I do personally feel as well that it's important for us to be aware because then we will be able to know, oh, actually Singapore is so safe as compared to other countries where there could be an armed conflict happening right, uh, right within your neighborhood at that point in time. I also think that a lot of times when we talk about being aware of international issues, international politics, right, we tend to be more familiar or more aware about uh, Western issues, right, or westernized uh, ideologies and what's happening in the major countries like United States, what's happening in the UK. So, like, uh, with the exception of Mr. Rehan, okay, <laughs> right, uh, who is very familiar and very aware with uh, other more, I would say, uh, exotic and um, diverse ethnicities and the issues that are surrounding uh, other places, other countries, right? Not so uh, Eurocentric. But it seems like whenever I look at social media, especially when people say that, oh, you know, it's important to be aware of global issues, right? And then they say, yes, I'm aware. And when they say they are aware, it's because of... Yeah, the fact that they are very aware of what's happening in the US, what's happening in the UK. So like, for example, um, the movements like uh, Black Lives Matter. That particular movement, right, got so huge because of what happened to George Floyd. And there were like quite a few voices out on social media where they basically air their grievances about how minorities are being mistreated in Singapore. And somehow or another, the conversation shifted from like whatever is happening in the US is exactly what is happening in Singapore when it's not exactly true. It's not entirely true, right? A lot of times we have seen that in the US especially, their politics seem to be skewed a little bit towards uh, identity politics already where they are looking at blacks, the African-Americans and the whites. But there's more to it. And obviously whatever's happening in these countries, we cannot 100% copy paste into what's happening in Singapore. We have so many different ethnicities and um, our policies and the way of life in Singapore is very different, vastly different from what's happening in these other countries. So I think that uh, even when we are to pay attention to international issues or global affairs, it is also... Uh, what kind of affairs are we paying attention to? Are we so focused or so heavily focused on the westernized nations that other nations are not as important? And then we give the excuses because our media space is so dominated by western ideals. We don't deliberately go on to find out more about other not so common or not so mainstream ideas articles, information about other uh, countries or other nationalities, ethnicity. Unlike Mr. Rehan again, I keep saying that because it's true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so that's something that I admire about Rehan because really, if you really go and talk to the average like layman in Singapore within our social circle, right, they really don't really have a lot of uh, understanding about other countries aside from the westernized countries. So one thing that Rehan was also previously sharing, you were also letting us know about how, you know, uh, you do enjoy a uh, Uyghur culture. I, I hope I pronounced that correctly as well. On that note, now that you are someone who has actually traveled to that region, do you feel like, you know, you know more about them or know less about them? With regard to that question, I, I'm a very narcissistic person. And <laughs> I admit that I believe that I know more about the, them than the average, person. Than the average person. 
And <clears throat> that is why combined with my uh, not so favorable personality, I would like it if people uh, don't try to impose their view on certain things without actually doing research. And the reason why I'm saying this is because I have been on the receiving end of that. <clears throat> it's about like this guy who I will not disclose his identity. He basically started to argue with me like, hey, we got this evidence. What do you think about the Uyghur culture? And then he started to say, oh, well, the Chinese is bad. China is bad. Basically, his whole argument is that China is bad. I tried to convince him using my absolute logic saying that like, oh, <clears throat> like, oh, China actually does have a national security issue. What you may be reading might not be true, especially like say during the Xinjiang cotton incident. But long story short, that argument seriously didn't go well. I mean, I didn't intend it to be an argument. I just hope that he did more of his homework. But that argument with him being more pro-West, I realized that it's actually really extremely dangerous. Mm. Because afterwards, then he's just like, oh, West is good, West is good. And then when I try to open him up to certain things that the West has done, like, uh, take note, I'm not blaming everyone, and anyone, but I'm just trying to open people to the fact that, hey, maybe... It's not black and white. Your Number one, right. is not black and white. That is very important. Like, a lot of things are actually more in shades of grey. I hope it's not 50 shades. <laughs> but, no, no. <laughs> but basically A lot of things are actually in shades of grey And every culture Has its good side and its dark mm. side So in the end That debate or rather Whatever whatever you call it Actually escalated into an argument So in the end it became me It became me being very like Frustrated It's just like you try to talk sense to some people And mm. they, they just don't listen And then afterwards then I just told the guy that Hey you know that US and Canada are like decent as well, right? They have done their fair share of atrocities towards like native aborigines or like Cree people or like all, all sorts mm. of Cherokee and whatnot. Yes. They have done all sorts of atrocities such as the like resident school system yes. actually end up becoming like killing grounds of indigenous children. A lot of discrimination. Lah. Even in recent day, like Canada actually had the Oka crisis where the Quebec government actually kind of face off the aborigines inside there. So there's actually a lot going on in these Western countries. You shouldn't really be painting a view of it. And he really cannot listen. Mm. How did it end up? The ending was that I started a, a market list of sorts of stuff that US did. Like example, like I tried to tell a guy, you know that they actually played a part in messing up South America. Because like example, they have Operation Condor. Operation mm. Condor is where they actually brought up a lot of right-wing dictatorships in Paraguay. Argentina, Brazil, the list goes on. They certainly almost played a part in messing up Central America as well because they turned all these republics like El Salvador, Honduras and whatnot into what we call banana republics. Basically, they farmed the crop under United Fruit Company and they committed atrocities along the way. Hmm. And if Chile didn't fall to a dictatorship in 1973, the US actually had a backup plan. So that is where I listed out all, all of this. And in the end, he surrendered. Mm. He, like thankfully he surrendered and ended my misery but he was just like oh we should be all united in God and then I just okay. ignored him accordingly mm, mm, I agree, I agree. wasn't the best experience <laughs> let's look at uh, the current COVID situation as well we can also consider the COVID-19 crisis so in the initial phases in Singapore a lot of what was actually rolled out uh, as part of our um, circuit breaker measures or measures in order to try to contain the spread of the virus uh, was actually emulated from the initial cases from countries such as like the origin of COVID, which was uh, Wuhan, China. A lot of these sorts of measures are definitely kind of like modeled after what uh, other countries have done as well. But then on this note, would it then be, I would say, still that important for us to consider about other countries and like trying to follow after what they do? Is it always necessarily applicable in Singapore then? Mm, I think that if you're talking about COVID-19, the crisis, definitely Singapore uh, did take reference from many countries, not only with regard to this uh, lockdown situation. So apart from lockdown, there's also uh, mask wearing. Right, actually, wearing of masks is something that, uh, I mean, it was met with a lot of opposition in Western countries, but it's something that is not too uncommon in uh, Asian countries. Like, I've seen... Taiwanese or even in Japan, right? When you're sick, right? Automatically, they wear masks. Oh, actually, even before yeah. the COVID situation. Yes, even before yeah, COVID. For them, they will just usually be wearing masks. Uh, if they are not they're, feeling well. Correct, correct exactly. So it's actually a pretty normal thing for them. It's just that when it comes to COVID, they have to heighten the, the measures. Lah. So to see this kind of drastic change or 
uh, opposition when it comes to the Western countries, right? You'll be like, what's the big deal about it? Just wear it and go on with your daily lives. So you could say it's a bit of an ideological difference, right? And there, therein lies the argument like, uh, if we were to take reference from other countries, you cannot take reference blindly. Obviously, it has to be based on a lot of considerations, whether we have the capacity to emulate these countries in the first place, whether our ideologies uh, even align in the first place. For me, I realised that actually, like globally, there are only three methods. The first one is zero COVID, which is what China is pursuing. The other one is all out endemic, which is what the Western world initially until today is uh, continuing to pursue. In fact, maybe that's the reason why uh, our favourite uh, Prime Minister Uncle Boris decided to embark on a Partygate scandal. And then the third one is... Uh, What's the scandal? Please share. Uh, the Partygate scandal is just about uh, how uh, our dear Prime Minister Boris Johnson decided to uh, host a huge social gathering in 10 Downing Street. Mm. And then afterwards... With the intent of what? With the intent of perhaps enjoyment. <laughs> <laughs> and, then af- and then afterwards Basically he came under fire From like uh, Certain leaders From the UK parliament Including like Very famously From the leader Of the li- liberal democrats To which uh, Our dear uh, Uncle Boris uh, Answered in um, Mandarin He was like Ni hao jian dao, ni hen gao xing. <laughs> But that's for another day uh, I love him Because he's very funny But that's the only reason Anyway moving on Is that The third way of addressing COVID Is out of sight Out of mind And that ha- Strategy has been adopted by certain uh, democratic countries such as the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, also known as North Korea, <laughs> and uh, Turkmenistan, which I don't know how well it's working, but uh, I hope they are fine because I really don't think it's working that well. So, but again, back to the topic and uh, beyond the jokes is that there's also a lot of factors to consider when we decide to emulate any policy. Mm. So the first one is like, say, the all-out endemic policy, how many people are going to get infected? Can your hospitals cope with the influx of COVID cases? Which we can see from Singapore's case, is not doing very well, unfortunately. I think right now it's still okay though, manageable. But there was one point of time. Yeah, it there was a, it, it was overwhelming, well. yeah. And also uh, basically the main concern is loss of life. And but for the zero COVID policy, which I believe is only being pursued by China, there's also a concern of ethics. So it's like, because they're they are just like really aiming for zero COVID, the numbers must be zero. So if there's an outbreak in a the city, there will be a lockdown of the entire city. Is it too extreme or is it adequate? And the second thing is, how is it going to affect people as a whole? Because I remember that at the beginning of COVID, like literally China was very aggressive in its curbing. But this has also very like, unethical effects mm. such as like how certain people like couldn't they have other illnesses but because say the father has COVID and then afterwards then the father was being forced, forcefully quarantined there's no caretaker for the sick young boy and the young boy actually died in the end Ayoh. and then there's also like elderly who, who really like they got COVID and then they didn't want to burden anyone so they really they just went out on the snow in a cold winter and just froze to death so there are definitely ethical concerns as well and the way China handled its COVID uh, initially is just that it also does have its problems because like it being like a more authoritarian state, I will have to admit that it paints a more rosier picture than the truth. So therefore, maybe it resulted in lesser preparation time as well. And on mask wearing, I think it's very interesting because initially I was a firm believer of mask. And then the transition actually came in December 2021 okay. because I decided to be cheeky and go to Melbourne alone on my, uh, on my holiday retreat. And the rules in Melbourne back then were actually really relaxed, considerably relaxed compared to Singapore. As compared to Singapore, yeah. You definitely still have to show your vaccination certificate. Reasonable. You have to upload your data onto Service Victoria, which is their version of Trace Together. So reasonable as well. The best part is that you only need to wear masks indoors. And if you're on the street, you actually can mask off. So I realized that and from day five onwards, day five of my so my trip was seven days. So day five of my trip onwards, I start to mask off. And then I came back, I was fine. And then recently, I just recovered from COVID. So it implies that I have got COVID last week. Ah, and which is in Singapore. <laughs> which, which is in Singapore. I wore a mask. I abided with everything. And I still got COVID. So this brings to the question whether, like, say, mask is really effective. Of course, if you are sick, please wear a mask. But if you are fine, the question of the mask comes in. Because mm. there are people from the West, which I know, they argue that the mask actually spreads COVID more. Because, you know, you wear your mask, you take off your mask, you wear your mask again, you touch your mask. And then all the germs are on there. So that is probably some of them, how they think as well. Mm. But for the human rights issue, personally, I don't comprehend it. Because I don't grow up there. I don't see how a mask has limited my facial identity severely. Mm. So, and my recognizability. So other than that, is, yeah, it's just that sometimes masks might 
but now on 29 March we're going optional one month. Yeah, that's right. So we are taking the the Australian. We are taking the Australian route. route. Yeah. But uh, the only thing I'm concerned. The Aussie route. I might be concerned is I uh, getting COVID a second time. I couldn't afford to do it because I have exams in April. <laughs> <laughs> so, key concern, right? Couldn't you like retake? No. Uh. uh, retaking is the worst option. I uh, I, I have another friend who got COVID like during last, exams. last semester during the during the exam period, while everyone is uh, partying and holidaying and slaving for <coughs> hall activities. <laughs> Uh, he was literally just studying at home and be like, hey, where's my makeup exam? It's nowhere oh. inside. So yeah, it was a sharp contrast. I was holding in Melbourne and he was just like, when is my makeup coming? Mm, <laughs> what modules I do I bid for? On that regard then, a lot of Singapore's actions, a lot of Singapore's stance towards COVID is also still kind of like emulating other countries. So right now we are moving on to the, the Aussie phase. <laughs> I suppose about the uh, going the Australian approach to, uh, in terms of our mask mandate. So on that note as well, it's perhaps important to consider then, of course, we should also consider global affairs as important, right? It's important for us to pay attention to what other countries are doing so that then we can adopt the best measures that are in place and the ones that might be most suitable for our own domestic situation. I might have to argue against the, this theory in the first place because my argument is that the problem is that every country is actually operating in a very weird manner. So the analogy is like, say that we are on the ship. The ship is supposed to operate as a single unit. However, every cabin, which is like akin to every country, is actually pushing out its own measures. So if we actually rewind the time back to 2020, if every country actually does have certain unified measures to actually curb COVID, like maybe we wouldn't have to suffer COVID until 2022. Maybe my travel plans won't be halted. <laughs> you have a more <laughs> personal vendetta against all these but, restrictions. But it was said by, if I'm not wrong, it's one of the WHO directors that basically the ship analogy is being raised by him. I don't know if it's uh, our favorite, uh, Monsieur Tedros, who has come under a massive fire ever since. But it was definitely one of uh, higher ups who actually mentioned this analogy about the ship and the cabins. But perhaps maybe every country has managed it differently because mm. we have to realize that the reality is that some countries had experience with SARS and most of them are East Asian countries. And whereas Europe actually was liberated from SARS or rather not polluted by SARS back in 2003. So they, they wouldn't have the most updated experience on like probably how to deal with it. And the societal attitudes, as we all agree, is that every country is very different. Yes. So the way they protest, we might not see a reason why they're protesting. Mm. So. I also think as well, like just now you mentioned about the mask situation, right? It could also be because like in Singapore, we are more densely populated. So like the rate of transmission is higher because like every, oh, Singapore is so crowded, so crowded. Okay, when you go to other countries like Australia, right? You don't really feel like you're always, you know, packing with people. And like, that I think is also one of the key differences as to how they handle the population's uh, strategy when it comes to dealing with COVID. The other reason I would say is probably due to good legislation. That must mm. be admitted because there are countries like Bangladesh with a much more dense population than us. Yes. But yet there's no mass mandate whatsoever. It's very difficult to control it over there. Yes, correct. All right. So moving on to our next segment, would you rather? But first, cheers. 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 All right. Okay. So here's the question of the day. Would you rather only care about issues that you can change and remain unaware about anything else or not be able to change anything at all, yet be aware of everything. All right, so between the two choices, which means I only need to care about things that happen around me and things that I can influence. And the other one is that, yeah, you can know everything, you can know it all, but you can change absolutely nothing about them. Maybe I go first. Quite straight, right? I, I think mine is one. quite short and see. I'd rather change stuff that I don't know, right? Is that the question? Change stuff that I don't know, I cannot control. Oh, uh, you can only change things that you care about. Yeah, okay, so I'll take that option. Oh. Yeah. Because I care about a thing, then of course I want to make changes to it. If I don't care about it, then I wouldn't even bother to change it. Mm. So then why do I want to bother to know about it? Yeah, but then you don't know everything else around rather than the only things that you care to change about, you see? Yeah, but if you know everything else and you realize that you know everything but you are not able to change anything, then what's the point? To me, la, that's how I see it. Like to me, I'm the kind of person that when I see something is not right, uh, something that I care about, right? Obviously, I want to make sure that it, it is better than when I first knew about it. I want to improve it. So I'd rather be in that situation than know everything and realize that I am limited or unable to control or change things. Mm. Maybe today I am really the opposition uh, guest star today. <laughs> I probably like, know everything, but not be able to change anything. Because in the real world, actually, a lot of things cannot be changed. Society has been, in a way, like somewhat set in stone because it has been 
influenced by some of them like in hundreds of years, millennia actually. And a society as is kind of like defined in communication terms vaguely as a group of people with uh, certain shared values. And these shared values can actually appear in certain forms. A lot of cultures, especially the cultures which I heavily specialize in, which is uh, Islamic cultures, they're actually varying and varying in conservatism as well. And these attitudes actually really stem from probably a lifestyle and probably certain past events that has happened in the long course of history. So this has actually made me think of like one of the films that I watched in the 32nd Singapore International Film Festival, which I went for last December. So I kind of forgot the name of the film, but I remember it was a cartoon. It was actually a feature ring on Afghan society, but it was by a Czech producer. <laughs> Mm. So again, it's very interesting because uh, it talks about how a woman of uh, Czech ancestry, of course, former Czechoslovakia, uh, actually got married over to Afghanistan. So like basically it's just that she met this guy in university and then they're just like, okay, I, I think they fell in love. And then the decision is that she moved over to Kabul with her husband's uh, extended family. So from there, we actually see that there's a lot of cultural conflict. Actually not really between the woman and her husband's family because she has like, kind of like long resigned to it. She's just like, okay, this is Afghanistan. This is how it is. This is how it works here. But the thing is that both of them actually kind of work at a U.S. embassy. And that is where the U.S. people actually didn't really understand how Afghanistan works. Like, because in Afghanistan, they are more conservative. So, like, there are rules that, like, don't, simply just don't make sense to us. Such as, like, when a woman is out, she must be accompanied by a male relative. Mm, yeah. And then be like, uh, especially when driving also. And then there was also a very ma major part where, like, her husband's brother or sister has conflict with the spouse. And then one of the US embassy members was like, hey, this is not fair. Like she's getting beaten by her husband. Why is she getting this? We should help her defect over to USA. And then only for the female lead to be like, are you crazy? This is Afghanistan. So that is something that actually really struck me in the movie. Is it morally wrong to hit your spouse, your wife? In my terms and in absolute terms, you would say yes. But in their society, from their perspective, is it wrong to do so? They might say no. And should we judge them for it? We shouldn't because it's their land and how they grew up in. Mm. Th like you shouldn't try to change it because if you try to change it, it will actually cause much more unneeded conflict. And it will actually rub off to locals as being very insensitive. In a way, it becomes like a greater wrong compared to what they have done. I, okay, it, it did make yeah. me think. Eh. Me, okay. No, I disagree. So, still, still, still disagree. <laughs> I still you need disagree. Disagree. Well, Why? because I'm a girl. So clearly, I do not want to be in that situation. No matter how we can justify or say that this is their culture, this is how it is, I don't think that once you have physical violence, once there is violence and harm that you inflict on someone, that is already wrong regardless of whatever background that you come from. To me, that is not acceptable. From my standpoint, is that. You see, when I hear these kind of things, I get very angry because I know that I cannot change it. It's not my culture. It's not my land. It's not my society. I do not grow up there. At the same time, I feel privileged in the fact that I am where I am and I'm able to change things because I know of these things. I know of the things around me and I can change them. So if, again, you pose to me that question, right, I still will resolutely stand by in my case that I'd rather not know about all these things because, like, it makes me so angry. Like, why are these women, just because you're born in that country, right, then you are seen to be lesser. It's okay to be beaten by your husband mm. or anybody for that matter. That is not right. No matter what, no matter what conservative ideals or whatsoever, to me, I cannot accept it. And... Thinking about it makes me so frustrated. It makes me so angry. I can't imagine if I have known everything. And then knowing that I cannot do anything, I'll be, oh my goodness, how, how can I live day by day? I don't think I can do that. For me, I actually fully understand where Miss Eunice is coming from. <laughs> the first okay, thing I that I wish to clarify mm. is that I am actually quite feministic also. Obviously, that's why I said I mentioned it's absolutely wrong. But again, mm. should you change them? That is a very huge dilemma to go through because it's, yeah. like, it's really so entrenched in your culture. That's why, apart from that thing which I actually thought about after watching the movie, and I actually also thought about like the fragility of men's ego in those countries. That is something that is also worth thinking about. Mm. So if there is a moral of the story, please go and watch film festival movies. They actually invoke a lot of thought. Definitely they are not the kind that give you a very conventional ending. Mm -hmm. I especially recommend certain Persian films to watch. For more uh, questions, please contact me at... <laughs> Open for applications. Open for applications. Slide into your DMs <laughs> lah. Slide into my DMs. My Instagram <laughs> will be below. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd have already been inserted. Yeah, on okay. YouTube, love. Actually, okay, now that I've heard both points, right, initially, I was very much on the first stance, right, that I would only want to care about issues that I can change, okay? But then actually, after listening to Ray Han, right, he had made me falter a little. Imagine if you are someone who only takes on a more passive role in 
the world just being an observer like how Rehan he says that like you know one thing that you also do wish to do is to go around and observe how the different cultures how they operate basically people's ways of life right and there are things that I should or should not change to those or rather I shouldn't change at all to those so it made me think that yeah you know actually from this standpoint as well I can consider that fact that like maybe I'll think that it's better for me to be aware of everything and then don't change anything at all because ultimately it's a question of whether we should or should not change it but then at the end of the day I will still stand by my original stand which is that I will only care about things that I will change about because I will also feel that as a person if I'm made aware of things that I won't be able to change I know that there are all these different sorts of atrocities things that I don't want to see going on in the world then it would make me a very pessimistic a very cynical individual I do suppose that so I'll still stand by the first plan as well but yeah both are equally valid and interesting to hear mm-hmm. Alright, so thank you for listening and watching our series. Do continue to stay tuned to our podcast. Please like and subscribe. Do also comment down below which side will you be on? Will you be standing more on Rehan's side or you'll be standing on Eunice or my stand? Bye! Bye. See you!